Let's try that again. I am Helen Lee, and I am the host of today's Teardown session. Apologies for the audio issues there. Um, so let's just get started. Um, I am hosting um, Discovery Dish Creator today, so we're going to bring him on in a moment. But before we do that, I've got a few um, a few things I'd like to share with you that's going on at Crowd Supply. So first of all, well, that's Discovery Dish. We're going um, we're gonna to give a big shout out to our sponsors of today's stream, the Corvo RF Accelerator. Um, so thank you, Corvo, for sponsoring today's stream. You can find out more about that accelerator um, at this URL. So let's take a look at what's going on at CrowdSupply. We've got a bunch of things crowdfunding at the moment, but I'm just going to show you some of my faves. We've got the um, Light 3DP Generation 2, which is a small hackable resin printer. Um, we've got version one is on the wall here. That was super popular last time, and this is the new improved version. So if you want a tiny resin printer, you know where to go now. Um, also on my radar are the Glow Stitch LEDs, which are delightful um, sewable LEDs from creator Steph Piper from Australia. Um, and she's created these flex PCB strips that you can just machine show, sew over with conductive thread, no soldering needed. So it's a great project there. We also have Seracit, a cool Home Assistant, uh, home assistant compatible um, Raspberry Pi um, Home Assistant situation with ChatGPT GPT voice control. Uh, and we also have Discovery Dish, um, which is today's um, today's uh, guest. So we have, um, let me just bring him on and then we can actually talk about it. Hang on one moment. Oh my goodness. Um, here we go. Let me take this off this. So we got, you can hear me now. I can hear yes, you. I can hear you now. It's working perfectly. Now. Here we are. So here we have Carl from um, Discovery Dish and RTL blog. I will uh, let you introduce yourself, um, please, Carl. <laughs> and so, we'll get um, started on Discovery Dish. Thank you for having me on. Um, I guess thank my you. name is Carl Lauper. Um, yeah. I'm probably best well known for running the RTL STR blog. Uh, which has been going for about 10 years now. Um, formerly, I'm trained as a computer engineer, and I did my PhD in machine learning um, shortly after that. Um, so during after after my PhD, after I written my thesis, I was getting quite bored, and um, I was just browsing Reddit, and I came across this thing called RTLSDR. And at that time, I knew nothing about radios or anything um, DSP or RF related. And I didn't really know what it was, but it was cheap, and I was a uh, poor student, so I uh, picked one up for about fifteen dollars at the time. And at that time, chipping was really slow, so about two months later, it came in, and I got it. And suddenly, I was amazed at all the the things I could see on the R spectrum. Mm. Um, that one class that I had in um, engineering school about uh, radio concepts suddenly just all clicked in my head when it was able when I was able to see the spectrum live on the screen. And from that moment on, I became hooked and I kind of changed my track of interests from machine learning to um, radio. Um, so I was always, every day I was browsing the internet looking for projects to do with RTL SDR. Because um, at that time I was just in my downtime waiting for my final um, examination for my thesis and not much to do. So I was always browsing and there was this blog that was posting um, uh, projects. RTLSDR projects every day. And every day in the morning, I'd wake up and check that site and do do whatever projects they posted. And then one day that project, that um, website just stopped posting. And then I was getting into with withdrawal symptoms <laughs> from uh, not being able to do <laughs> RTLSDR projects. And then after about two months of um, them not posting, I was like, ah, screw it, I'm gonna make my own website, a similar one and post my own projects that I'm doing in tutorials. And that's kind of how my blog started. Wow. And then of course, that, slow, that slowly started taking off. And by the time I finished my um, thesis examination, that website was already kind of up and running and it was making some money from the ads and um, affiliate links to the products and stuff like that. So that was time for me to either get a job or continue with my business. And I decided to just continue on with the blog and keep posting and doing more things with it. And eventually that ended up me um, creating the RTLSTR blog line of dongles. Yes. 
which is um is that your at the first moment, piece of hardware that you released yes yeah i mean at that time it was basically just um approaching the chinese factory that makes mm. them and telling them to make a few minor modifications and then over time i because i ran the blog i would see all the problems that people were having with um these dongles because at the time they were basically just um modified tv dongles that um didn't really have any hardware modifications to them mm. like nothing specific for sdr um so i'd see all the problems that people were having with them and then i was like i can just i can fix these quite easily if you just approach a factory and tell them to make a few changes so that's what i did and that's how the rtlstr blog v2 came about and then eventually i made more and more changes as i learned more and more about rf and then i became came up to the v3 and now the v4 yeah that's um cool. yeah and then from um, rtlstr i kind of um eventually met um said karim my Business yep. partner for Kraken RF. Yep. And Which he asked me if I had any popular, of course. <laughs> <Everybody> <laughs> he had a, he asked me if I had any any um, ideas that I wanted to make, and I always thought that um, coherent SDRs were pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how we we started off with the Kerberos SDR, which was um, four RTL SDRs coherent together. So with that, you were able to do like um, direction finding um, and other projects. And then we eventually moved on to the Kraken SDR, which we successfully crowd crowdfunded on CrowdSupply. You did. It was a very popular project. I'll bring that up in a minute, actually. If you want to talk about that a little bit, I can bring up the. Uh, I'll bring up the Kraken. <laughs> yeah. So that's just. Um, there's basically five RTL SDRs on a single clock on the same PCB. And um, there's a few other things in there as well. Like uh, you got to make sure like all the, uh, the RF lines and everything are all identical to the sub millimeter. But um, with that, you can do things like coherent projects, like direction finding, like radio direction finding. Yeah, I've, I've brought up the. So you can here. kind so, of find the location of any signal that's being transmitted. Yeah, that's it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we usually do is we um, put those antennas on a car, and drive around with the Android app that we created, mm -hmm. and then as you drive around, it will create bearings um, towards the signal of interest, and over time. Um, create a heat map that shows you exactly where that transmitter is. And this was your first project with Saeed? Uh, the first one was Kerberos SDR, oh, yeah. which we crowdfunded on another platform. Um, and then we refined it into Kraken SDR, which we ended up crowdfunding on CrowdSupply. Yeah. So Kerberos SDR was four tuners, and then this is a refined version with um, five tuners yeah. and automatic um, ability to, to calibrate. John, to talk us a, few, a, a bit through the um, these screens. What are we seeing here? Because you've got some really interesting analytics um, that come with us, the Kraken yeah. SDR so web interface. So yeah, that right there is the control screen, and below that is the um, spectrum screen. So what you're seeing there is just the spectrum of yeah. um, the signal that we're tuned to. And here is the um, DOA graph, which is the direction of arrival graph. So where the peak is, is the angle that the signal is coming from relative to the um, array, to the mm -hmm. antenna array. Mm -hmm. And that's just a polar plot of the same graph there. So you can kind of yeah. use it like a compass to point exactly where you want to go. And here's your app that you were talking about earlier. So yeah. when you put your, um, when you put the antenna on the car and drive around, this is what you're looking at, yeah? Exactly, yeah. So yeah. we, um, included um turn by turn navigation so mm. if you're just a single person in the car you don't need to take your eyes off the road nice just listen to the uh to the navigation instructions and then you'll eventually end up where the signal is so it's much safer than having to yeah constantly look at the map oh that's a really nice functionality very cool oh, lots of stuff here oh look at this this is fun okay. yeah that's a, a roof array if you yeah. want to have a static array yeah, with great project. And how did this lead in then to the discovery disk? Because you're working with Saeed again, aren't you, on this device? Um, yeah. Yeah. How's that? How's that? How did that come about? Do you want to talk a little um, bit about the, that? Well, basically, one of the applications for Kraken SGR is um, possibly hydrogen line interferometry. Okay. So I've always been interested in science things like that. Um, and one of the things we want to do is eventually get multiple of these um, dishes and um, hook them up to the Kraken SGR yeah and be able to do interferometry with them so that's basically increasing your um 
resolution by using multiple small dishes instead of like a huge massive dish, which is going to be really hard to manage. Um, but I think the main um, use case of the dish will be for L-band weather satellites. Yeah, let's take a step back here and, and talk about the different bands, because that's one of the really interesting features of the discovery dish is so you've got the main dish itself, which you see here is the perforated thing. Mm -hmm. But then you've got the um, the device in the middle, like almost like a stamen, I guess those are the those are in, interchangeable feeds. Am I correct in saying that? So you've got three yeah. different um, central bits. Can, can you talk about what each of those are, what the options are with those and and also like what kind of data you're getting from that and what people like who would be looking for that data? Yeah. So the most popular um, feed is probably going to be the L band satellite feed, which is um, designed for satellites like um, GOES. Um, these are American satellites in geostationary orbits. So you just basically point the dish at it, and yeah. it will always be in that position. And from that satellite, you can get um, quite beautiful um, images of the Earth, of the full Earth. Um, and you can see the weather patterns, and you can create nice animations of it if you have multiple images um, over time. Um, you can also receive HRPT satellites, which are polar orbiting. Mm. So these ones, these ones move across the sky. Um, so you need to track them somehow with the dish. So you can either track them with your hands or you can use a mechanical rotator. And I want to talk to you about your couple. mechanical rotator as well. Yeah, we'll get to that later, yeah, I guess. Yeah, we'll get to and, that uh, later, yeah. yeah. I definitely want to hear more about that mechanical rotator. Um, so, and, um, yeah, so the, the polar. And then there was a third one as well, right? Um, um, uh, still in the satellites, you can still, you can also receive um, the Korean satellite, GK2A. Oh, nice. Um, LRIT signals. Um, there's some Chinese satellites too, which you can receive, and some Russian ones. Um, then the second band that people might be interested in, which is a different feed. So you just have to swap out the PCB or to swap out the um, the white head that you can see on the image there. Yeah. Um, to something else. And the second band, which most people would be interested in, is probably Inmarsat, which is a different type of satellite, um, mainly used for data. Um, so one of the signals you can get in there is Aero, which is signals transmitted from aircraft. Um, oh. It's mainly like short messages and stuff from aircraft and sometimes telemetry, things like that. Um, you can also get voice um, from some aircraft. Um, you're only able to hear the voice coming down from the aircraft, not um, the ground station. So you get one one way only. Mm -hmm. But um, that can be still quite interesting to hear the random things they talk about. Um, so is that? Also, yeah, sorry. carry on. Carry on, carry on. <laughs> yeah, there's got... also um, standard C, STDC, which is um, mainly yeah. information meant for mariners at sea. Oh. So you get things like, um, sometimes you get interesting messages like um, warnings about pirates or um, warnings to stay out of the area because of um, military exercises, um, also the regular weather stuff, things like that. And has this been popular? Um, so, so far, most people have just been receiving this using a patch antenna. Uh -huh. So you can receive this with a patch antenna, but um, in some locations, the patch antenna might not be, might not receive the signal strong enough. So that's where the dish comes in. I see. Um, I you see. can receive it much stronger in that, in that case. Um, but yeah, it's been pretty popular because um, you could just you could basically receive them with a modified GPS antenna. Mm -hmm. So you you just get a cheap GPS antenna from AliExpress. Um, take out the filter if there's any. Some of them are so cheap they don't even have filters, so you don't need to worry about that. And just plug it into an SDR with a bias T, and mm. you can receive them quite weakly, but you can still receive them in most cases, especially standard C. Um, and then I actually created um, a patch antenna, which I sell on um, the RTLSTR blog, which receives them much stronger. And now, of course, it's a dish for if you want to receive them um, even stronger in some locations. Yeah. And um, I guess there's the, also the third band, which I talked about before, which is yeah. the hydrogen line. Yeah, what's so, this used for? What, can, what kind of data can you get from this? Like what's, yeah. Um, it's not that. really it's not it's not um data this is more like a kind of like a science project you're measuring something natural oh. 
oh. um, part of the natural world. So, oh, see. so the galaxy has got a lot of um, hydrogen in it. It's the mm. Milky Way, our Milky Way. So when you look up, all those, when you see the Milky Way, you're seeing a lot of um, hydrogen gas being reflected. Um, it, it turns out that hydrogen actually emits a signal at 14, 20 megahertz, um, which can be received if you point a satellite dish at it with the appropriate feed. Um, you need a feed and a satellite dish um, with really low noise figure mm -hmm. to be able to see the bump. And you need to integrate the, the spectrum over a long time to be able to actually see the peak. But um, so there you can see in that image there, you can see kind of like the peak when I'm pointing it directly at the middle of the Milky Way when it's up in the middle of the sky. Yeah. And you might see that it's not exactly at 1420 megahertz though, because um, it will be slightly dopp uh, Doppler shifted um, depending on where exactly in the sky you're pointing at it, because the galaxy has arms which are moving at different speeds. Mm -hmm. So this is the way that um, ancient radio astronomers figured out that we live in a spiral galaxy. Really? I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Really fascinating. So nowadays you're able to do um, these experiments that um, just in your backyard. That's really cool. That's really cool. Is there anything else that like you wanted to tell us? Why don't you tell us a little bit more about this device? I mean, we've looked at uh, the um, the different feeds that you can get. Actually, I do have a couple of questions like what um, around um, around these feeds. And um, how do you actually switch them in and out? Is it a mechanical operation? Just like plug in. Plug yeah. Out, so like... you basically just need to pull one out and um, change the cable and plug it back in. So, um, yeah. But I'll I take you outside. Interested to hear. Oh yeah, do yeah. let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. Let me. No? Um, okay. Yeah, if you want to, like, I'm I'm at a pause, so we can. Uh, let me. I'll, I'll take the. So I'll just change down. the camera. Yeah. Do you want me? Let me know if you need me to switch to another screen. Okay. Yeah. I'm just gonna switch around the face. I'm gonna switch the camera. This one. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Right. You're still coming through loud and clear. Clear. So you're. Uh, so you're show us one set up. Yeah. Beautiful. Look at this. So I show you what I've got set up in my backyard right now. Yeah. This is just a prototype, um, so don't worry too much about the paint and the the holes being in weird positions. Um, this one's been beautiful. been a laser cut holes, and the laser cutter wasn't big enough to fit the whole dish on at once, so that's why the holes are in a bit weird positions. But the actual thing that will be manufactured will be stamped, so the holes will be perfect. Um, so you can see here, this is the the feed part. Yes. And what's the one that's on there currently? So right now I've got the L-band satellite feed on it. Mm -hmm. And right now, if you could see where it's pointing, if you had telescope eyes, you could see um, the GOES-18 satellite, which okay. I'm currently pointing at. So right up there is the GOES-18 satellite. And this is what it's pointing at right now, receiving um, weather satellite images. Oh, wow. And inside there is just a PCB um, antenna, which I can show a bit later. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and then you come back here, and you see the the feed arm and the mount. Yeah, I see. So one thing you can do with this dish is you can just loosen these um, set screws, and then you can easily rotate this, depending on the polarization of the satellite. Or you can also just rotate this whole head here if you wanted to. And then we come down the feed arm, and we've got the, the feed cable coming through. And at the moment, I've got set up here um, an outdoor enclosure. So in here, I've got my Orange Pi 5. I'm running uh, RTL TCP with my RTL SEO blog V4 plugged into it. I see a little dongle there, lovely. Yep. And here's a PoE um, splitter. So I've got PoE coming in there. Mm -hmm, I see. And that comes 12 volts. And then out of here um, is a 12 volt to 5 volt um, converter, which powers the Orange Pi. And 12 volts um, is also split off to run the rotator, which I'll show a bit later. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so I like the solution because basically only you need one cable 
um, coming in from the inside, um, one PoE cable, which handles your data and power. Mm. Uh, no need to run any mains or don't need to run, plug 12 volts in somewhere and then lose voltage along the way. That's amazing. That's a great idea. I do have some questions about your design decisions, but we'll, I'll let you um, show us around yeah. and we can um, talk about those when you're sat down. And, those um, are really cool. I like, the, I like the choice of power that Ethernet. It's something that I'm seeing a lot more these days. Yeah, I think it's going to take off quite a lot soon because uh, it's, it's really a good solution, I think. It is quite oh, noisy, though, in terms of um, uh, radio noise. I was so you need say, to be really I mean, careful. Yeah. That's why what, we have it on of, this um, yeah. metal box here, which will yeah. seal the nose in and keep it away from the dish or the feed. Yeah. Um, and while I'm out here, I just want to show all the, all the um, other options and prototypes I've been through. Um, I've been just doing, like designing this for maybe about two or three years now, um, slowly going through all the options that I can find. And this is the, this is the, the final version that I've come to. But I started off with this um, 2.4 gig Wi-Fi antenna. Nice. So these are, well, they used to be quite cheap on Amazon before the pandemic. Um, you could get them for like 50 bucks, but nowadays they're over 100. Oof. But um, a lot of people have been using them for uh, the same thing for L band weather satellite reception. Yeah. Um, they're tuned for 2.4 gig because they're for Wi Fi, of course, but um, they just happen to be okay to use um, for at 1.7 gigahertz for L band weather satellites. But um, they did quite. Um, they were quite weak overall, and you still needed to attach an LNA. Um, so this is uh, actually one that's sold by a different company, um, and they provide a modified um, 1.7 gig feed. But the problem with these dishes is that they're really quite heavy for what they are because they're cast. Yeah. Um, so this one is about 1.6, 1.7 kgs. That's quite hefty. That's yeah. cast metal. And compared to this, which is only about 800 grams, 700 grams. Oh, wild. That's a huge difference. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the conversion to uh, freedom okay. units. <laughs> I, I have no idea what they mean either. People tell me a yard, yeah. and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So. <laughs> If anyone's interested, this is just what's inside these feeds. It's just a, a dipole. So, oh, and, um, this one is tuned for 2.4 gigahertz. And then the ones that are tuned for 1.7 gigahertz, you just extend it a bit, make them a little bit longer. Um, yeah, but the problem with these is they're cast and they're quite easy to break. So I've already had a few break there. And of course, because they're gridded, they're mm -hmm. They only have um, lines coming in uh, lengthways. So with satellites with polarization, you have to kind of rotate the whole dish to get the polarization match. So if you, because right now my, the satellites I see here come in with um, 45 degree polarization. So this dish would need to be rotated 45 degrees like this. And then if you wanted to point to another satellite, which has got the opposite polarization, you need to take the whole thing apart and rotate it like this. Yeah, so yeah. it's kind of a big task. Not exactly and, convenient. Yeah, and then with this, you could all you need to do is just rotate this, just oh, to feed. Oh, I see. That's much yeah. better. And um, it only lets you rotate at forty-five degree angles. So if you happen to have a satellite that is um, rotated at twenty degrees polarization relative to your location, then you're going to lose out quite a lot of signal with the with these. Yeah, for sure as well as it being massively inconvenient. Yeah. And they come with um, quite thick cable, which is not really needed. It's not nowhere near uh, as flexible as Ethernet. <laughs> yeah, this is, I mean, this is the coax cable, which comes from the, yeah, um, yeah. the LNA to the radio. And these are really, really stiff cables, yeah, which are really yeah. hard to manage. And they're low loss, but um, if you've got enough gain on the LNA, you don't really need a thick cable. Mm. You can just use a much, like thinner cable like this, which is a lot oh. easier to manage. I can see, yeah, coaxial cable is really annoying to work with, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah, especially <laughs> these really thick ones. This is LMR yeah, 400. Yeah, 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 I yeah. I completely agree. I completely agree. I, like, I it's think totally the, the, the design decision for power of the Ethernet is an excellent one. Yeah. 
and I really, I'm really excited to see the rotating design as well. I mean, it's a very physical design. It's you know, like there's no, there's no software involved really. Is you know, yeah, I mean, the software is all um, third party. It's all open source. So this the yeah, software like yeah. set stuff, which is already existing. Yeah, it's just the hardware which is. Um, needs to be made easier to access i think exactly and i and i'm really excited like you've done some you've done some really interesting things with the rotation device and the fact that you're mm. using power over ethernet and i was just wondering if you might um does you can talk uh, we can talk to a little bit about your design process you know like who you had in mind while you were designing this you know because i know that you're yeah. on the less expensive end of the market which i guess mm -hmm. um you know that also requires a bunch of design decisions like what what you think needs to be cut out what can be cut out yeah so exactly. I, I'd, I'd really like to hear from you like who you had in mind while you were designing this like how you went about choosing your parts how you went about um you know making these design decisions um whilst yeah so i guess the the market is um yeah definitely the lower end i want this to be affordable right um for almost everyone to to be able to um obtain so these dishes here um being heavy and quite big it cost me over 100 us dollars to get shipped to new zealand Damn, so, so it's like um hundred dollars for the dish and then hundred dollars for the shipping um where something like this is going to be split into three pieces so it's going to be much in a much smaller package and then of course being much lighter the shipping should be much much cheaper um yeah, i just wanted to quickly show the, the oh, other dishes that oh, these, I yeah show me. um this was a 60 times 40 dish which was um a much smaller version of these bigger wi-fi dishes mm -hmm. but um it turns out this is not big enough um really for for goes to work properly um then i shifted to one of these dishes which is also a wi-fi dish but it's made of um, steel mesh um it's quite heavy still it's over about 1.2 kgs um and then eventually i found um a manufacturer that could stamp a dish kind of like this out of um aluminium and stamp holes into it did you get that done locally them. or in china no this was uh, in china and that, um, what's, what's the material there do you say alum, uh, aluminium aluminium yeah Al aluminium whatever How aluminum. <laughs> whatever yeah um yeah. okay cool and this was, and, was uh, this yeah, an, so one of the it. early prototypes that you had made for the discovery yeah this is a 60 centimeter version um yeah the prototypes and the 60 centimeter version works fine but i decided um we had a we had space and shipping um availability to ship a 65 centimeter dish which gives a little bit more snr yeah yeah uh, signal to noise ratio so it's it gives yeah. a, a bit of a stronger signal um i guess while i'm out here i quickly show the rotator just yeah, a prototype you, yeah please show me the rotator and explain it a bit as well and know why people would use the rotator would be useful yeah so this is just a prototype rotator um just all 3d printed so basically what's in here is two uh brushless dc motors uh, one for elevation and one for azimuth um they're just small dc motors that can run off um the 12 volt um limit from um coming in from poe um they're quite highly geared so they move a little bit slow but it's fine for tracking satellites um so here you can see it's just attached to uh, the dc motor through these flanges yeah i see that and it's just hanging up here by for azimuth um turning yeah yeah i see and coming in here is serial and 12 volts um so the idea behind the rotator is that this dish is light enough to be moved by um, light duty motors. So we don't need to build a, a really expensive rotator. There are rotators around like um, the Satnox rotator, um, which you can build yourself. But um, building that is quite a job, actually, because <laughs> you need to 3D print a lot of things and um, build it's your true. own circuit. That's very, so very DIY. Yeah, I got about I mean, halfway through building a Satnox rotator and then decided to make my own one which uh, yeah. <laughs> which ended yeah, up yeah. like this yeah like, shout out to satnogs we we do love satnogs everyone loves satnogs yeah <laughs> but hopefully this can be used for satnogs too but um yeah sure and, uh, yeah oh and one of the questions for that i saw online was yeah. can the dish be used with satnogs and yes it can yeah you can just um 
just use a uh, simple U brackets to to get it onto the um the arms they have on their rotator. It was their ten year anniversary recently, I believe. Satnol. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, didn't they, I think they won the first Hackaday Prize, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah. Yeah, and this Hackaday Prize just um did ten years. They're actually closing in it, which is sad. But yeah, Satnox won Hackaday Prize ten years ago. It's wild how quickly the time goes. Um, but very cool. I'm glad you can use it with it. It's nice to see the open source communities like feeding into each other. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I'll switch back to. Hello, nice to see your face again. I'll show my face again as well. Ooh, wait, let me bring both of us back in. I will de-solo you. Hello, nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you for that tour. That was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, really interesting. Actually, the Satnogs, um, the Satnog sideline um, actually had mm -hmm. me. Uh, it's a question I wanted to ask you. So I know that you've um, engaged with open source in different ways um, throughout your different projects. So I was wondering if you might speak a little bit about that, like what um, the value of open source to the work that you do, um, and also like what um, what advancements you see in the field of open source and just your personal relationship to that whole thing, yeah. both software and hardware, would be really interesting. I mean, the whole reason that this thing can exist is because of open source. Um, so there's a program called SatDump, which is completely open source, which is um, third party, not created by us, but um, it can, the, the author has worked really hard on it. He can receive pretty much any satellites um, that's out there now. He can create a coder for almost anything. Wow. So the whole reason that this thing can exist is because um, of that software where you basically just, it's got a GUI and all you do is log into the GUI, connect to your dongle and um, choose whatever satellite you want, point to it and receive. Um, and he's really receptive. Um, you just talk to him online. You and say he is it just one guy doing it. It's just one guy, yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are contributors, of course. I mean, but um, this one leader. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah, it's yeah. always the case on open source. There's like one person yeah. holding course, the world yeah, on their backs. Multiple contributors. Backs. It's not just one guy overall, but um. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the leader. Yeah. yeah. That's really awesome. Um, That's really and it's cool. also been other tools like uh, Ghost Tools, um, which was also open source, which was um, uh, a couple of years before his, um. And uh, yeah, a while ago, there was only closed source tools for things like um, SCDC. Um, and nowadays, there are open source tools. It's the tools um, that are the important part. Uh, everything yeah, can follow then, once the tools are open source. Yeah. Yeah. And the closed source tools are kind of fallen into the background now. So. That's really interesting to hear because I hear that from a you know like I you know I'm not a domain expertise in every type of tech obviously but like I've, I've got yeah. like a I, I get a broad view from lots of different types of technologists um because yeah. of my work but um I, I do hear that more and more that more and more tool chains in lots of different um domains are being opened it feels like the floodgates are being opened all the yeah, way from exactly. like you know from <laughs> silicon to sdr to like all these yeah. things there's you know people do it people are cracking the tool chains and it's mm -hmm. becoming you know more advanced so that's quite interesting so how um what what are the commercial i mean so you you've de you've designed this really so for um you know to be affordable um and that opens it up very much to the hobbyist community like the um you know the amateur radio yeah, exactly. people and so on so i was wondering if you could tell me like what kind of communities of interest that you see within your users right so uh, you know you've got to have some information on like who's using what feed and who you know what interests there are so i'd be really interested to hear more about like who's doing this why are there so many people yeah. interested in listening to satellites is it just P pure curiosity like or yeah, yeah. just <laughs> i mean i guess that there is quite a big um online community of people who are just uh receiving it for fun yeah i mean or just for yes. education um but there are also people like uh i guess preppers and um people who are remote or um rural that don't really have internet or they are afraid um you know one day the what happens when the internet's out you know yeah yeah, um, yeah. then how are you going to get critical weather data, critical satellite data. That's so true. So it's good to have your own setup just ready to go if you need it. Um, Much more prevalent out here on the west coast of the US, I have to say. Like, yeah. There's a lot of space. <laughs> it's, it's not It's not theoretical. There are giant mm -hmm. swathes of this part of the country where there's zero connection. So yeah, exactly. it becomes a, a bit more of a practical consideration right, in this part of the world, that's for sure. Yeah, I guess for... Um, 
for hydrogen line there's there's that's quite a an active um, amateur radio astronomy community around oh really interesting um, so yeah i guess a lot of those um people have already moved on to much bigger dishes and and uh, they're doing things like um detecting pulsars um oh, wow. which is quite a, a more advanced task but um yeah, the, the whole idea with this dish is for the hydrogen line feed, I guess, is to get more people interested in um, radio astronomy, since hydrogen line detection is pretty much the most basic task you can do with it. Um, sure. Yeah, I guess Did schools and uh, educational institutions can get students interested in, in uh, the science behind hydrogen line reception. Yeah. The yeah. hydrogen line, I, you're very interesting. I didn't know it could do that. Um, did you, I know that you had some things on that your computer that you wanted to share with us. So I don't know whether you wanted to do that now. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. just before that, I wanted yeah. to show. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you'd like to do. We have two minutes left camera. just to let you know. So whatever you wish to do. Here we are. Okay. Let me, um, spotlight you first. There we are. Oh, what are we looking at here? I just wanted to show the other rotators that I've been testing. Um, Ooh. so this is the Ant runner rotator. Say that again, this is the one that, it's called Ant Runner. Ant Runner. Yeah, uh, nice. I don't know where the name came from, but um, this is one that I've been using um, prior to the one that I designed. Um, so this one is consisting of uh, stepper motors mm -hmm. that he's used combined with. Um, so there's a stepper motor there, and there's yeah, the gearbox there, and of course the stepper motor controllers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the problem with this one is. It's quite a hefty, heavy thing. Yeah, because of course we've got a lot of ship here. It looks pretty. Um, and of course, it's it's completely exposed, so it's mm. quite useless for keeping out in the weather over time. And um, I've already had a uh, had a few raindrops hit it over time. Um, and of course, with this one, it's they haven't used a worm gear uh, motor on it. Oh, it's a so, worm. You have, or you have. No, it, it hasn't used a worm gear motor oh, okay. or um, gearbox, so it can just be moved by hand. Oh. So once the power goes out, once you remove the power, the whole thing just comes crashing down. So <laughs> it's quite dangerous if you've got a dish on there. Oh, damn. Yes, that is quite dangerous. I can yeah. see why you might not have wanted to ship that. And what's this and, one? Um, there's also, this is... Um, Soft this is another third party. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. This is created by an amateur radio club um, mm -hmm. in Australia. Um, this one is is pretty good, but it, it doesn't really work for um, satellite dishes. Um, it's only really meant for use with um, Yagi antennas. Oh, yeah. For amateur radio use. Um, so you can see it's just got a a shaft sticking out there, yeah, which you can attach anything to. Mm. Um, and this one uses. Um, an IMU for control. Oh, interesting. But um, the problem was this: is that I found that with something heavier, like like a dish, yeah, um, it just it causes a lot of oscillations. So it's really hard to filter out those oscillations. Mm -hmm. So with uh, my version, I'm just using um, potentio potentiometer uh, feedback instead. Yeah. For for control. Um, That's smart. That's really smart. And um, so these are the two devices that you bought from elsewhere that you were using, like yeah, while you yeah. were researching I mean, what you were going to do with yeah. your own. Um, so these are, yeah, these are what I was um researching with. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they all had their flaws that I decided to incorporate them to to change in my design. So yeah, no worm gear needs to be um weatherproofed. Yep. Um, can't use an IMU because it will oscillate. Um, well, it's, like, it's really like often you can get some really great, um, some really great decisions by using other people's things and thinking I don't yeah. want that. You know, it's, yeah, it's exactly. easy. <laughs> sometimes it's easier to think about what you don't want um, as opposed. Because I was just searching for something yeah. that would work with um, the Discovery Dish if I could just yeah, promote yeah, that alongside yeah. it. And exactly. Then I just couldn't find anything because these are all within the um, two hundred uh, no three hundred dollar price range. Okay. And uh, so they're semi-affordable, and then the next step up is um, more heavy-duty rotators, which start maybe eight hundred, nine hundred thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Um, so what's going? So what's happening with the rotator? Like when you know you, you yeah. What, what when's it going to be finished? Um, you know, what's the when can people get it? I don't want to give any timelines because yeah, yeah. You know, anything happens. It's just a prototype at the moment. It's just one of the second one I've made um, so far. I'm sorry um, to push so, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, want it now. <laughs> it's, it's been out here for maybe two weeks now, so it's been going fine for two weeks. Um, I uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's great. Hopefully, I hope it will be ready around the time that um, Discovery Dish can ship, but um, I can't guarantee anything. Well, good yeah, luck. Because I want to, I want to, you know, with something mechanical, you wanted to. Um, do some long-term testing with it. Yeah. Make sure the gears hold up over time. Oh, yeah, and, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and where would people be able to find? Do you are you one of these people that prototypes out in the open and you write about it um, and on your Twitter or Reddit or whatever? Yeah. You know, so, uh, do you ever yeah build blogs? And we'll post some updates on the RTLCR blog. Yeah. Um, on the rotator and also the Discovery Dish um, updates. I guess um, I post. On yeah, too. yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so I know that you had a couple of things that you wanted to show on your screen. Did you want to yeah. take us through any of that? As we've got, we're we're 15 minutes away from the end of the stream, somewhat in pop okay. name. <laughs> well, it's fine. We can go over. It's not a big deal. There's no there's no uh, hard and fast rule. So yeah, maybe... sharing All right, this. Right. Okay, you want me to to just share your screen? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we are. And um, um, it's just shared so you can steer. Yeah. So I'm just showing the uh, the CAD model of what the uh, the final dish would look like. Oh, nice. Um, so it's going to be split into three pieces. Yeah. Um, so the stamping machine will create three pieces um, per dish. Mm -hmm. um, they can be stacked on top of each other for shipping. So you can get a much smaller box. Oh, that's um, cool. Back here will be a uh, mount. Um, which I didn't show because it hasn't been uh, created yet. But once the stamping um, dies have been created, we'll be able to create the mount, which goes on the back here. Um, you can see where my mouse is. Yeah, I can see. We can see that. Yeah. That works. And then yeah. it will uh, connect onto the uh, the L plate um, mount, which is currently being used. Um, yeah, and you can see the the holes will be stamped perfectly. Yeah, that looks um, lovely. Also, I just want to show some. Yep. Right. Um, and you sh if you might have to press present again. Yeah, I'm just looking for the. That's all good. Um, There's some websites that. Um, all right, let me put that on. Show it like um, this one from Derek, which is a beginner's guide to HRPT reception. Mm. So you can see that these are all the HRPG satellites you can receive. So you can receive the um, NOAA POSE satellites. Yeah. Um, Meteor M, which is the Russian ones, Metop um, and Semyon, the Chinese ones. Yeah. Um, let's see. I mean, I'm assuming. So some other ones. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, these okay. are some other ones that um, people have created themselves. Oh, nice. Um, so it's, they're using helical antennas. Um, yeah, I see. Helical feeds. But we decided to just go with um, linear polarization feeds for our, for our one. Yeah. Um, you lose 3 dB, um, but the signal is strong enough with this dish that it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Um, just showing different types. Yeah, this is the 2.4 gig um, version that yeah. some people have been using. And what else did I want to show? Oh, yeah, this, these are what the signals look like when you see them on the spectrum. Oh, nice. These are the images you get. Oh, yeah, I wanted to show some images. Uh, example images of what I received. Just change the screen. Oops. Maybe you might be able to do that again. 
I, I did have a question as well about yep. the um, about the feeds. Now you're mentioning all of these different satellites. I'm assuming quite a lot of those communications are encrypted. You know, I'd be like, you know, what or do they use different satellites for that? What are these? You know, the feeds um, that you're picking up. Like, how are you? You know, decoding. So these these feeds are all non-encrypted. Okay. Um, it's possible that in the future, um, we don't know what what they'll do. They might encrypt new satellites. But the current ones and the train so far is no encryption for these satellites. Oh, interesting. Since these are kind of, um, I guess, public satellites. Um, the public not military based at all. So I yeah, guess, yeah, sure. Of course, all the sure. military ones will be impossible to receive. But um, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. All right. What was the other thing you wanted to show us? Uh, just quickly wanted to show uh, here. Oops. So, uh, you see that screen? I can. One second. Let me add it. Here we go. There you go. So this is just some of the examples of um, what you can receive. So full disk is probably the most interesting one. Um, it might take a while to load. So these are all the infrared images. If I scroll down. Should get the color ones. Um, what has picked these images up? Which um... this is the GOES eighteen satellite, which you can see from my location. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure if this will. Oh, it's not showing on. There is it. Um, I'll no. switch the share. Uh, it's not. I'll just quickly switch to full screen, I guess. Our screen. Oh, I've got something. Yeah. I've got the full screen. Oh, because of... Here we go. There we are. And remove. If I... So, yeah, these are the kind of images you can get from um, the GO satellites. So you oh, get really nice, nice focus images. Yeah. I'm down here somewhere in the corner down here. Oh, yeah. So the satellite from my location is about at um, 24 degrees elevation. So if you're in the US, it's probably going to be a higher elevation and you'll be... Of course, oh, look, yeah. we can see California through the clouds, I guess. That that's, is, that's, that's the US up there, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, actually, you can see the mouth of the Columbia. That's quite interesting. New Zealand is just in the corner, hidden away under this cloud, I think. Yeah. Uh, just like my home country, it's normally hidden under cloud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maori word for New Zealand is um, Aotearoa, which means land of the long white cloud. So <laughs> that's uh, we, tracks. Yeah. <laughs> Accurate. Oh dear. Yeah, you can see this is uh, really cool. The sun goes down. Wow. Black disc. Sun comes back up. You can of course animate this to uh Yes. See the clouds moving nicely. That's really cool. Um from the meteor satellites. get um, something like that, which is a bit closer because it's polar orbiting. So of course, it's much closer to the Earth. What are we looking at here? Um, it's not a satellite image from Meteor satellite. Yeah. Meteor M2. Um, oh, it's a different class of satellite. Yeah. So this satellite, is, of course, it's much it's polar orbiting, so it's much closer to the Earth. So you I get much that, closer yeah. images. So this is kind of like zoomed in on, on my area. Um, oh, those are light formations. Yeah, yeah, these are cloud formations. I see, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can see that um, my house is kind of blocking the, the south side, so it gets cut off on the south side, but this is coming down from the north to the south. Oh, interesting. Um, and we also have from Noah. Oh yeah. Look at so there we can see a bit of New Zealand top bit it's of the North Island poking out. I'm down here somewhere. What am I? Just... I can see. Yeah. Yeah. Auckland, no or, cloud. Yeah. <laughs> so when I'm receiving it, um the satellite is coming from the top up here. My mouse is coming mm -hmm. down through there. And this is where I'm, I'm pointing at it. And then it's receiving just in these areas. Um exactly where it is above me. 
super interesting. I love it. Yeah. You can see all sorts of things. All right. Well, we're coming to kind of the close of the show. Mm -hmm. So let's 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 um come back to you know us, our faces. Hello. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to um ask how long okay, how many days have we got left on the discovery dish? um campaign i think it's about two weeks left yeah something like that isn't it yeah let's just check up here so we've got 14 days exactly two weeks mm -hmm. left um yep. so um so definitely check that out if that's something you're interested in um do you have uh so people can just follow you on rtl sdr um blog um and do you have yep. any social media handles that you use or um, is that mainly Twitter, the blog? Twitter, rtl sdr blog yeah um yeah that's probably the main one yeah. And is there anything that you're looking for help from from the community? And that's one of the joys of open source. This is one of the things. Is there, put the call out if you're looking for any help in certain um, in a certain aspect of your design. And, and so, um, you know, is there anything you're looking that, for? Uh, we want more people to test it. Um, once I get a few more prototypes, I might yeah. put a call out for some testers, especially in Europe. Um, there's a satellite which I can't receive, which is um over europe which is um electro l2 mm -hmm. um, we need testers to receive that one um so oh. i guess the once the campaign finishes we're going to make the uh, mold and then we can make a few more um, prototypes which might set, um, send out to a few people who can set something up uh, mm -hmm. quickly Yep, that's exciting. Um, yeah, there's a lot of um, satellite nerds in um, in Europe, in particular in Athens yeah. and Berlin. Um, I uh, yeah. Athens is where Satmax is from, I think, um, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. Um, anyway, thank you so much um, for joining us on today's stream. Um, it's been really interesting. Me? Are there any like are there any thoughts you'd like to leave us with before we head off and have our lunch, and you can have your breakfast? Um. <laughs> I don't know, just get out there and receive uh, satellites. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Whatever you> want. <laughs> it's a really awesome program. It's a, it's yeah. a really awesome um, project. So thank you so much for talking us through. And thank you especially no for showing us your prototypes. Um, yeah. So thank you again for being our host. Um, I will speak to you. Um, I'll speak to you after the show. If you hang out in the green room, I'll just do a little debrief. Yeah. Um, but for the, the people joining us from home, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and thank you for sticking around while we um, sorted out our audio at the beginning beginning of the show um i will the next tread on stream i believe will be the 15th of december so i'll um be um announcing that um in the next week or so but i'll put that in before i say anything um but yeah have a really fantastic week um i will see you again really soon thank you for joining us on the stream and again thank you to corvo our sponsors for this week all right see you soon bye bye